Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to PDAC 2022, and we are moving on with our yeah, online interview session here, and we want to talk to Arizona Zonoran, and uh, George Ogilvy is the CEO, is here with us. Good morning to yeah, Toronto. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, thank you, Joachim. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, great. And thanks for taking the time, actually, as I could not travel to PDAC, unfortunately, but uh, so we can do it at least in this format. I interviewed you, I think, in the middle of November last year uh, with the Precious Metal Summit, and I liked your company already there a lot. Now it looks like you guys have done several steps forward in addition. For example, you got uh, Rio Tinto as a shareholder. How did that happen? Well, uh, Rio Tinto approached us late last year. <clears throat> Within their division, they have a, <clears throat> a group called Newton mm -hmm. that has been looking to develop uh, the leaching technology for a primary sulfide, which in this case would be calcopyrite. Mm -hmm. So uh, within our deposit, we have oxides enriched material, which we intend to heat leach. But the primary sulfide essentially at the moment is a stranded resource i.e. it's not leachable and we don't intend to build a copper flotation circuit. So they had uh, shortlisted a group of companies in Arizona. Uh, ours was top of the list. Mm -hmm. They felt that our company uh, had every opportunity to see the mine permitted. We could bring it into production in the next couple of years. They felt that our primary sulfide would be very amenable to their technology. Mm -hmm. And um, they believed that we had a credible management team that has a track record of, uh, you know, putting projects into production and creating a lot of accretion for the shareholders of the company. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they approached us and we entered into an NDA. They did due diligence. Uh, they took samples from across our deposit. They conducted uh, modeling and some bottle roll tests on those samples They've all come back uh, extremely positive as far as recovery is a concern. And uh, shortly, we should be entering into a one-year exclusivity with, uh, with Newton to do more uh, detailed column tests uh, on those samples. Mm -hmm. So because of those results, uh, they uh, invested 10 million US dollars into the company, mm -hmm. which was part of a 35 million Canadian private placement that we closed three weeks ago. And uh, today, Rio Tinto is a 7% shareholder in the company. Wow, fantastic. So that means you have a lot of cash and you are, let's say, re yeah, cash rich now to really go full throttle towards production decision. Yes, we currently are sitting with 42 million Canadian dollars cash in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fully funded through until the summer of 2023. And uh, before that period of time, we should have produced a pre-feasibility study in the next mm -hmm. three months, a bankable feasibility study in the early part of 2023, and hopefully project financing is actually announced uh, sometime in the second quarter of, mm -hmm. uh, of next year. Okay, super. Before we come into some more details, because you had already a robust uh, PA, um, when I hear Arizona, I'm always asking about permitting. Um, are you on federal land? Are you on private land? Mm. Because we know sometimes uh, it is not easy to do so. So can you elaborate on this, please? Yes. Well, 100% of our claims that we have at the Cactus Mine and Park Salier are all on private land. Mm -hmm. So we've already had the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers conduct what's known as a JDS, a, a Jurisdictional Determination Survey, and they have concluded that there are no waters of the United States. So therefore, there are no federal permits actually required for this site. Uh, and we have that confirmed in writing six, uh, six months ago. Mm -hmm. So we're only dealing with the state regulators. Mm -hmm. And in essence, that means that the permitting process is a lot more simplified and actually has defined timelines. So once we submit an application for a permit, once the application is administratively accepted, and it can take several weeks or even months to have a permit administratively accepted, but once that occurs, a clock starts ticking, and within 180 days, we must receive a response from the regulator. So, for example, on this last permit that we acquired, which was an amendment to the aquifer protection permit, we applied for that in mid-October of last year. 
Within five days, it was administratively accepted. The 180-day clock started ticking. And uh, before the end of March of this year, we physically had the permit in hand in our office in Phoenix. And within that 150-day period, there was a 30-day public consultation period. And during that period of the time, the company received no concerns from the uh, the public, nor did the state regulator. So we were delighted in, in achieving that permit in record time. And we believe the remaining couple of permits that we will require before we begin construction and development mm -hmm. in the, um, the second quarter of next year mm -hmm. will be in hand by the end of the year. Wow. That's super fast, I would say. But what I like is the fact that this is all really fixed and with timelines, you know. So you have no, let's say, as um, yeah, funny surprises. <laughs> yeah, it's not like a black box where once yeah. the federal uh, government gets involved, you know, you put applications in, but mm -hmm. you just don't know when you're going to get a response out. Exactly. So how is the support from the people living around, let's say, communities? Uh, do you have uh, any, let's say, native uh, issues or how, how does it work? Yeah, so we've got a very strong social license on this project. Um, the mine is uh, three miles west of the city of Casa Grande. Casa Grande has a population of 55,000 people. It's an expanding, growing community. Um, within the city, there are a couple of uh, American electrical vehicle manufacturers. Nikola Trucks and Lucid Motors are actually right in town. Um, so a couple of years ago, we conducted a perception survey with 400 respondents. And at that time, we had an 85% favorable rating to see the mine come back into production. Wow. We we repeated the same perception survey in the fourth quarter of last year with 500 respondents. And this time we saw an 82.5% favorable rating to see the mine come back into production. And I think, as I explained earlier, the fact that during the public consultation on the last permit, there were no concerns raised by the public, I think is a strong indication that we have a lot of support from the community to see the mine come back into production. Yeah, well, that is really fantastic. Um, let's talk shortly about your P. I know you're working on the PFS and the, probably with the PFS, you will um, yeah, figure in also the inflation adjustment mm. for the last, uh, let's say, 12 to 18 months. Um, but still, I see a mine life of 18 years, which is fantastic. And uh, you will have a yeah, beautiful production between 56 and 80 million pounds. So where do you see, um, uh, annually, of course, uh, where do you see your all-in costs per pound of copper? Just a, a guessing, please. Yeah, because we know yeah. the PEA is a little bit outdated in that sense of the inflation. <laughs> but what is your feeling it could come in in a range? And uh, how much money need to be invested up front, approximately? Yeah. So on the PEA, which you've correctly stated, Joachim, is, is over a year old now. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial upfront capital was 124 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. It's relatively low because this is a heat leach operation. Mm -hmm. It's also a brownfield site. So we have access to water. There's already a main power line coming right through the property. Mm -hmm. Of course, since then, uh, we are in a high inflationary period. And for the pre-feasibility study, we are expecting that capital number to increase to somewhere in and around 200 million US dollars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would be an approximate, you know, 50, 60 percent uh, increase there. Mm -hmm. um, the PEA revealed a C1 cash cost of $1.55 US and an all-in sustaining cost of $1.88 US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We believe those numbers obviously will rise. And I think for the all-in sustaining costs, we're probably going to be looking something that's in and around that sort of $2.20 to maybe mm -hmm. $2.40, mm -hmm. again, because of the high uh, inflationary period that we're currently in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that was also my guessing, but still with uh, with copper price today at $4.30. And uh, I think probably it will go to 6 to $7 within the next three, four years. It would be a lovely margin to have. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's yeah. still lots of margin there uh, for the shareholders of the company. 
Ja, okay, super. Um, I saw also an interesting slide that you have a journey towards net zero, your partnership with um, MinViro. So mm. what is that? I mean, well, towards net, net zero would be great for ESG, right? Yeah, exactly. So last year we brought in a group called MinViro out of uh, London in the UK. Mm -hmm. They conducted what's known as a life cycle analysis on the PEA. And essentially, it was a cradle to gate analysis looking at scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions from the mine over the 18-year mine life. And uh, at that point in time, with no action plans uh, embedded into any of the uh, studies, we would be looking at in and around five to eight kilograms of CO2 emission per tonne of copper actually produced at the mine. Per However, tonne of copper? Yeah. Wow, that, that's nothing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively low. Yeah. However, if we were to introduce various action plans, there is the ability over the 18-year mine life to actually get that down to net zero. Wow. And of course, we would ultimately like to see this copper go into the you know, renewable energy sector. And it doesn't really make sense if the copper is going to go into an electrical vehicle that in the production of the copper, you know, you're actually putting all these greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere. It kind of defeats the purpose of the copper going into the renewable energy sector or that electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. So uh, when our pre-feasibility -pre study comes out in the next several months, um, investors will be able to see that we're going to start putting some meat around the bones with respect to our uh, environmental strategy, uh, mm -hmm. with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. I love to hear that. Um, what is, uh, let's say, going on for the next uh, three to six months? Obviously, you are working on the PFS. So uh, do you need to drill more out here? Let's, I don't know, infill, drilling, um, some step outs, whatever. And also, where do you see the next exploration potential to enlarge the mine life in the yeah. future? Well, the infill drilling for the pre-feasibility study was completed in February of this year. Mm -hmm. So okay. the mining uh, engineers are currently putting together a mine plan built from uh, mostly an indicated resource. There is a little bit of measure in there. So when this pre-feasibility study comes out in the next several months, we will have maiden reserves actually within that, uh, that technical report. We are currently conducting an infill drilling program, but we're targeting indicated resource there to move it up into the measured category ahead of a bankable feasibility study, which is due in the first half of 2023. Uh -huh. And as your listeners uh, will know, that, um, you know, only measured and indicated resources can convert over into proven and probable reserves. Uh -huh. So that's the infill drilling program. Uh, we're very excited about an exploration property known as Park Sailor, which is two kilometers to the southwest of the main Cactus project. Mm -hmm. It's all on private land, so therefore there's no federal nexus. We're only dealing with state regulators. Mm -hmm. um, we've drilled uh, probably about 30,000 uh, feet of drilling actually uh, on the uh, site to date. We've released some of those holes to the market. But we believe there's a potential to add upwards of three billion pounds of additional copper from Park Salier mm -hmm. over the next 12 to 18 months as we continue to explore and uh, expand the deposit. So that would take our current compliant resource from three and a half billion pounds of copper in the ground to something well north of six to six and a half billion pounds almost mm -hmm. doubling the current resource. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds great. But first you have to drill it, of course. <laughs> yes, but, but the, the potential thing, is definitely there. The good thing about that, Joachim, mm -hmm. is we now have the cash in the bank mm -hmm. to drill it out into the indicated category by the end of the year. Wow. Okay. That sounds like a game plan. Fantastic. Yeah. As you said already, you have enough money in the bank. That is great. Um, we spoke already about Rio Tinto as a large shareholder. Who are other large shareholders of you? Well, uh, the largest shareholder would be Tembo Capital, mm -hmm. who are a private equity group out of London. Yes. Uh, we we IPO this company last year, November. And at that time, pre-IPO, they were a 44% controlling shareholder. 
Today, they are a 35% controlling shareholder, but they did put 10 million US dollars into the IPO in November. And with this private placement that we conducted, um, you know, three, four weeks ago, they put in an additional 6 million US dollars. So they've been extremely supportive of management and the company, putting uh, their, their, their money where their mouth is, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they've uh, taken some dilution, which they believe is uh, positive because obviously having a 35% shareholder sometimes can uh, deter uh, institutional funds from investing yeah. in the company. Okay. And who, which institutions are still in? Um, RCF uh, are currently invested. Uh, we have uh, Commodity Capital who are okay. invested in the company. And that we is also um, um, Tobias Tretter, right? The German. Tobias and yep. Uh, yep. Underbid, yep. Uh, they're, uh, they're invested in the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, we also have uh, Macquarie. Uh, wow, who, nice. Uh, invested in the company on the equity component. And of course, uh, they would be one of the banks we would want to speak to, you know, from a, a, a debt uh, perspective mm -hmm. once we get to the project financing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what is management share? Management shares around 6% mm -hmm. um, since joining the company in July of last year. Uh, I've put 2.8 million Canadian dollars of my own money into the company wow. at a weighted average price of around $2.48 Canadian share price. Mm -hmm. um, as of yesterday, the stock was trading in and around $1.95 Canadian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I would say that's a real statement. If uh, the CEO puts $2.8 million in, I like that. Honestly, I will buy shares of you because I really like your company. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's really fantastic. Super. Yeah, George, thank you very much uh, for the update. Uh, that looks all sound and safe. Um, I would suggest that you guys drill, do the PFS, and then go full throttle for the production decision soon. Then. Yes, completely agree. Thank you, Joachim. Super. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was George Ogilby, the CEO of Arizona Sororan for PDAC 2022 and Commodity TV. Yeah, you heard it. I think the company is in fantastic shape with Rio Tinto, a big investment into the company and also some really large, great shareholders which are backing the company. Also, we spoke about the inflation of the CapEx. It will might rise from $120 million to approximately $200 million, but still, that is a no-brainer for such a great project. Project. And I like the exploration upside potential that they might hopefully double their resource base and, of course, through that get also higher reserves in the future. PFS, hopefully by the end of the year, then that would be also great. And uh, I think uh, the copper markets are also a no brainer. So you really should have a look onto this fantastic company. Thanks for watching us. That was PDIC 2022 Commodity TV. Bye bye from Switzerland. <music>